Hi, everybody. This is Donna Prosser, Chief Clinical Officer here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation. We are so excited today to be joined by Robin Begley. She is the Chief Executive Officer at the American Organization for Nursing Leadership and also the Chief Nursing Officer at the American Hospital Association. And the AONL has recently commissioned a report um, on the findings of, of nursing leadership and the experiences that they had during this COVID-19 pandemic and some of the lessons learned. So welcome, Robin. Thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Don. I'm really happy to be here with you. I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. Um, I've been the nurse executive for the American Hospital Association and CEO of AONL for, for two years. Prior to that, I was a chief nursing officer at a small healthcare system in southeastern New Jersey. I had been in the CNO role for 20 years and spent about 35 years of my career in, in uh, southeastern New Jersey at that organization in a variety of nursing leadership roles. My clinical background really is um, the maternal child health space where I started and had probably tw about a dozen years in clinical practice. Excellent. Well, welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. We are really excited to hear about your findings from your survey. And so I will just go ahead and pass it off to you and you can walk us through this great presentation. Thank you, Donna. So I'd like to start um, maybe by telling you why we commissioned this, this study, the survey. We um, at AONL really want to support the nursing leaders and the nurses in the field and we wanted to do it in a meaningful way. We know there was lots of information that was um, you know, being sent every day, whether it was via emails or you know, we, we all watch the news, we watch for, you know, to learn about COVID. And we strategically decided we didn't want to inundate our members with lots of information, but really wanted to provide them with what they needed. So we had been sending out um, you know, a select group of mailings around, emailings primarily, um, around what we thought would be most important to them, but we really wanted to find out what, um, what were the needs. So this was um, a survey that actually our partners, uh, Jocelyn, helped us, and, and I have to give them a little bit of a plug. They approached us and said that they would like to do this um, pro bono for free um, to help us with, you know, and they really wanted to give back to the nursing community. So, um, you know, they, they really did a wonderful job for us. So we planned, you know, what questions we wanted to ask, ask some demographics, which you'll see on the slide, but really to find out what we needed to know to support our, our, our nursing leaders. So if you want to scroll through a little bit, Donna, um, the way the study, the next slide, please, the um, survey was conducted it was, um, there were a few actual, there was a, there were, before the survey went out to all of our members, there was also some conversations with some of our members, a, a small group, to make sure that we were asking the appropriate questions. And then um, we sent out a survey in July. It was, the window of time was actually very small. It was only 10 days. Um, and at back if we, you know, I know, in COVID time, it's you know sometimes hard to think back. But when we were you know we're thinking about July, we had some organizations that were really in the thick of things from a uh, surge perspective. We also had others that were basically had stopped their normal operations at the re, at the direct direction of, for example, their governor, and were waiting because they did not have COVID you know in their in their settings. So it was a real mix across the country and within. Um, actually, within the first several hours of the survey being sent, we received several hundred responses. We just could not believe the response rate. So we, um, we received almost uh, well, a little over 1,800 responses with, you'll see, as you see on the screen, really high level of confidence, um, you know, and the margin of error was 2.82%. So, you know, really reliable information. Next slide, please. As to be expected of our of our membership, you know, over eighty percent were the, the nurse executive and nurse chief nursing officers, the VPs, the directors or managers, and this is pretty consistent with our membership demographics as well. Here you see a map of you know kind of the um, where the concentrations of respondents came from. 
Um, so obviously the red, you know, or the where we received more more responses from, but it, it gives you an idea that we really did have responses from across the country. So what did our nursing leaders tell us were their most, you know, their most pressing challenges? Early on, and, and we, um, you know, we asked them for different stages. So where were they and what did they perceive as challenges as they move through? Because again, this is not hitting everybody at the same time across the country. So the primary challenge early on really was there was no playbook. Even for those that responded that they did have, of course, their emergency planning process and, and policies and procedures, nothing specific to this pandemic or even close to this pandemic um, existed in their organization. And also, of course, you know, the shortage of PPE in particular and testing. Um, you know, also concern about staffing. Those in the surge part of the, um, of the pandemic expressed concerns that they, you know, they were frustrated that they um, didn't have the answers. Either they didn't have the answers to give, but they also weren't getting answers, and that they perceived that there was a lack of trust due to conflicting information. And if we think back, you know, it's a novel virus, it's a new, you know, a new organism. The, what we told our staff on almost a daily basis in the very beginning changed. And it was really hard to you know, keep changing the message to get it out there to everyone, our staff, and also to um, have them believe and trust in us. And you know, I think the secondary challenge listed there, you know, as we had travel nurses travel the country, as we had, particularly in the surge areas and a big nursing shortage, you know, this was really a change to the culture. You know, I heard from so many nurse executives outside of the survey that, um, you know, that really sort of validated this information that they had never experienced, for example, um, not knowing where the gloves or where um, N95s were going to come from was so such a different culture perspective that they were always used to. Some of these, these items that were now in short supply were so ubiquitous. I mean, they were just all over and they never imagined that they would have to do things like conserve. You know, and in the sustaining phase, and as we look at this, I think this is really being experienced by many parts of the country at this point in time. Um, you know, we saw that there was a financial impact to staff that we had to lay off, that we had to bring back. And as we close other services that are not related to COVID, I mean, this is one of those really um, significant concerns. First, from a financial perspective personally, but also from an organizational perspective, because we know that hospitals and healthcare organizations were really hit so hard. So, um, you know, really just, you know, a di different, different perspective, and these were the concerns. Um, and just, you know, we heard wonderful stories about innovation, but just the um, pace of change, I think really did, you know, have an impact and was challenging to the staff as well. So, you know, as we said, nurse leaders really recognize that building trust um, is difficult when there's constant change. Mm -hmm. So some of the challenges. Um, you know, and, and I know you can all see the slides and I, I'm not going to read every sentence verbatim, but um, this was, again, from the perspective of the nursing leaders, 75% of nursing staff on average received training to learn new, new competencies related to COVID and, and um, you know, and, and care of the patients. And their perception was that 62% of the nursing staff were needed to treat COVID-19 patients. So when you think about that, that includes, you know, transferring and um, just-in-time training for nurses from areas that, for example, the elective surgical areas that um, didn't have elective surgery pretty much, um, were asked to come and work in areas that, that were, um, you know, were designated COVID units and how they were then given training to be able to adequately and competently take care of those patients or assist those, you know, a part of what we also saw was great team models. So um, I thought this was pretty, pretty, uh, pretty important. 
almost half of the organizations that our nurses came from increased their ICU beds um, and used them for longer than they anticipated. And particularly back in the beginning of the pandemic, and you know, July is probably, you know, obviously a few months into it, you know, we were seeing that length of stay for those patients really was much longer than the average length of stay. So this makes sense. Not only did we have more patients in ICU, but they stayed for a longer time. So significantly amount. Um, a more amount of ICU beds. Uh, and when we asked what were their organization's top three challenges, you know, we kind of got, um, if you look at it, pretty much four responses. So access to PPE, communicating and implementing changing policies. We talked about that a little bit. Um, interestingly, and I think very importantly, the emotional health and well being of staff. We heard that, you know, and in the qualitative component, we heard stories of that, you know, very frequently. Um, and then 54% responded, you know, search staffing training and, and, um, and reallocation. So all those issues that nurse leaders normally are concerned with was only heightened um, during, you know, during the pandemic. And the nurses felt, if you read, you know, if you look through this slide, that um, on the Likert scale of one to five and five being very, very well, the nurse leaders felt that they addressed um, those challenges very well. You know, average uh, or the high score of four or close to four, you know, and the lowest score, you know, a little over two and 2.5. I, I th think too, when you, when you, you can crosswalk almost the previous slide, those, those um, asterisks challenges were the ones that were identified as the hospital's biggest challenge. Okay, what did our nursing leadership expect moving forward? And I'm, I'm just, I just have to add this comment that I wonder if we redo the survey today, if we would, if we would get the same um, responses. And it was only a few months ago, but we know how, um, how much the science has changed and how much we've already learned. But um, this is where our you know, nursing leaders, what they were thinking in July. So which of the following temporary advancements will be the most important to maintain beyond the crisis? And they were asked to select two. So we sort of, again, about four sort of rose to, um, rose to uh, you know, the, the larger, you know, the most quantifiable responses. And I'm going to put on my glasses here because I can't see these all on the screen. But um, Increased utilization of telehealth, and we see this and we hear this not only in the, um, you know, in the survey, but from everyone that we talk to and all the webinars that we've conducted. Um, organizations have expressed that they tried to use telehealth prior to COVID-19 and, you know, both from a regulatory perspective, but also from um, an, uh, uh, an adoption perspective, either the patients really weren't too crazy about it, nor were their staff that completely changed. And actually there has been really widespread adoption of, of telehealth. Um, adaptation and adoption of new staffing models. What we did find was when asking specifically about best practices here, it was really the intra-professional team. So in critical care, new beds, having nurses without critical care skills, you know, the experienced critical care nurse along with perhaps the respiratory therapist, um, you know, their physician colleague, as well as I'm just going, you know, some models had one or two um, surgical nurses or med surge nurses who participated on the team, along with nursing assistants, they created a team to take care of a team of patients. And this is a little different than our modified primary nursing model that we, um, you know, that we customarily see. We also saw things in the field where teams of folks got together to do testing um, in one response and one, one story that a nurse leader told us how they partnered with, you know, to become a care team to take over some of the extended care facilities in their, in their geographic area. So a really great opportunity to see some creativity and also, you know, models that we may want to, um, you know, to uh, continue beyond. Um, increased interdisciplinary collaboration, as I mentioned, um, and wider recognition of nurses' contributions. And when you think about this, um, 
you know, I think the whole care team got a lot more recognition. Um, nurses in particular, I mean, just the hero aspect of what um, nurses did every day. Um, you know, we always had the caring and, and trusting label, but I think, you know, this gave the public um, more perspective of nurses as, you know, clinical leaders and um, brave, I'm going to use the word warriors that, you know, that kind of um, left, you know, left their families, were selfless in their, in their, um, you know, in their, you know, it, it was very rewarding to see nurses being portrayed like that. I think the, and they recognized that um, getting recognition really did help support the morale of the team. You know, and I would generalize this is not just about nurses, of course, we know it's really about all the care team, but, you know, very interesting to see how um, nursing is being perceived. And we're, we're going to be seeing if this leads to an increase in people. Um, and we hope, you know, all genders, very diverse folk think about nursing as a career. So hopefully that will be one of the silver linings to yeah. this, to that this horrible okay. pandemic. Mm -hmm. The next slide, uh, let's talk a little bit about how would you rate the support you have received from the following entities during the pandemic? And um, I think, you know, very briefly, I'll say that most of the people, the nurses that we um, surveyed felt that locally their, um, their organization, their care team, the local folks, even so, even um, to a greater extent, their local communities were very supportive. The federal response um, fell short in the estimation of the nurse leaders. So whether it was lack of consistent information or um, lack of a consistent process about how um, the COVID pandemic was being handled, and some of, the, some of that came out in the uh, qualitative um, information we received, but interesting that that was their perspective. That perspective. Okay, the vast majority felt prepared for a future, future surge. You know, sad to say right now, probably many of um, the nurses that we surveyed are in another surge. We've, we're seeing this all over the country. So, you know, high 80s or, you know, mid to high 80s, 86% felt that they are prepared. Great. You know, I mentioned a little earlier too, the survey consisted of um, obviously some quantitative, you know, questions, but we also had a few um, fields where we asked some questions. And I don't know about you, Donna, but when I've taken surveys, you know, sometimes you see those blocks and you wanna fill out the survey and then you see the qualitative area and you write a few words. You know, just so if anything, yeah. <laughs> yes. And just so you can get if it's a required field, you you put a few words in so you can get to the next section. But we saw hundreds of stories, literally, wow. that were paragraphs and paragraphs long. Um, on the screen, you see some some examples. Um, you know, the need to share their story and to connect with others. Um, really was so, so powerful. And, um, you know, the folks, our staff that, that read the comments, um, actually the, the, our, you know, our partners who conducted the survey, they said they just sat there and cried. I mean, reading some of the stories. So what we're trying to do now with, with probably close to 500 separate um, stories or responses is we're trying to figure out a way that we can publicize more of these with permission, of course, but we thought that there's just such rich information here and there's just, um, you know, just how much heart and soul everybody poured into taking care of each other, of their patients. I mean, it was just, it was really extraordinary. So um, hope we have an opportunity to share that with everyone. And, and we're, we're actually working on that right now. Great. So that's pretty much our key findings. Um, we found that, you know, and I guess to sum it up again, I would say that we got really great information about how our organization can support our nursing leadership 
uh, members. But I would say that if I had one takeaway, it was that we have to support them emotionally. You know, they told us we were doing a fairly good job at communicating, you know, clinical information. We had um, sponsored webinars where the East Coast folks that were in the middle of the pandemic could share their stories with people who hadn't seen it yet and were, were sort of wondering what to do. But really, they most mostly they said that they wanted to have an opportunity to share um, and express their emotions. And they really wanted to connect with their colleagues across the country. So that community of nursing leaders, um, you know, and, and sharing this experience was really most important to that. And that's what I feel that we are able to provide for them. And even though right now um, we can't do things in person, you know, because of the restriction, we found that when we had our our annual virtual conference, which was the first time we've ever tried that, and we had that in September. We had um, we were we were shooting for 500 attendees virtually, and we had just shy of 3,000 that participated. And the chat room, the chat box on the side, and the opportunity for people to just connect virtually was astonishing, and we got really positive feedback. Um, so that told us that people do need to connect, even if they can't do it, you know, in person. Wow. Well, and you know, you know, Robin, here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, we're an international organization. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I imagine that every other country can, you know, looking at their nursing leadership would probably have exactly the same findings, you know, that I would agree. Yeah, this is hard, hard work. And um, so anything that we can do here at the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, to assist you in your efforts of providing that emotional support, we are happy to do so. And, um, and so we really appreciate you coming here today to share these findings from this survey. It's very important information. Uh, you know, even though many of us may be tired of the pandemic, our, our, our frontline team, our nurse leaders are de still dealing with this every single day. And um, they're, I know they're exhausted and they're tired and I, I am, very, very grateful for everything that they're doing and, and, and everything that you're doing to support them. Oh, well, thank you, Donna. We, we, like you said, we're just trying to provide the support, um, you know, and I know that so many um, organizations have reached out and really are trying to partner because we all want what's best for our, you know, for our communities. We want what's best for our staff. And I, I, the, the unprecedented nature of this pandemic, um, I think we can all agree, has really also um, promoted unprecedented partnership. So I think that that's, you know, I, I try to look for the silver lining um, and I found a few actually in, in, in the pandemic um, experience. And I think that that's one of those things that maybe, you know, we will learn lessons from and be able to um, make sure we don't forget post pandemic. It was my pleasure Thank here today. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful rest of your day. This, of course, uh, pre this presentation will be available on our YouTube page, and we will also share a copy of the slides in, uh, in the description of the video so that you can have access to that. Uh, thank you again, Robin, um, and uh, we hope to have you back again to talk about, about findings uh, that perhaps if you, if you hear, learn more information in the future, we'd love to hear about it. It would be my pleasure. Thank you, Donna.